Hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, Ochre webinar by Computas. Um, uh, we are so far waiting for uh, some more attendees, so we just uh, start with a minute. Um, I can start with presenting myself. Uh, I'm Hans Karim from Computas. Uh, I'm working as a client executive there and I'm responsible for the Okra initiative from the Computas side. Um, today I'll speak and I'll also have my colleague Morten speaking in the second half of the presentation. Um, what we're going to go through today You can go show the agenda, please. Yes, we're going to start uh, briefly with why cloud? Uh, why should enterprises go on cloud? Uh, I'll try to uh, explain how we can unleash the potential of the cloud. And then Morten uh, will take over and uh, tell more about the Google Cloud platform. And they will also uh, uh, show some Okra scenarios. And uh, the last 15 minutes, we hope to have a Q&A session uh, where our experts uh, will answer live. Um, OK, let's start. Uh, if you got questions, take the next slide. Yeah, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, enter the questions in the Q&A section uh, in the meeting room, and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. And I'd like to mention that uh, this webinar will be recorded, and it will be sent to you later today. OK, uh, brief presentation of uh, Computas. Uh, we were established in 1985 and uh, was actually an AI company, a legacy that we're quite happy to bring on the table today. Uh, we we're about 300 employees uh, in Oslo, Copenhagen, and Bucharest. Uh, we are 100% owned by the employees. Um, concerning the cloud, we are partners with the uh, Google and uh, Microsoft, we are uh, delivering single and multi-cloud uh, projects. And uh, that's uh, actually what I brought us to the table with Giant and Okra. Uh, after 35 years uh, with AI and uh, uh, at least five, six, seven years with cloud, we have quite much experience, many clients, and uh, we're also operating in the, the Nordics and Southeastern Europe. And uh, we see the Okra as a very good uh, opportunity to help uh, higher education research with cloud adoption. So why cloud? Uh, with cloud, I am actually talking about uh, the the hyperscale cloud uh, uh, platform providers uh, like Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. Uh, for about six, seven years ago, Gartner mentioned that uh, cloud is, is something that everybody has to prepare for. And uh, the later three and four years. It is slowly appeared. Uh, and uh, today, uh, there's no discussion. Cloud is a part of many enterprises today. Uh, go to the next, next please. Let's take it uh, at the U European level. Um, back in 2018, more than 26 percent of the European enterprises reported that they use cloud computing services 
26%. But take a look at the situation in 2021. Uh, European organizations say that migrating more workloads to the cloud is the most important cloud initiative, 70%. That's a quite extreme increase. And 59% claim that they want to cut down costs by optimizing, uh, uh, performing optimization, which means that they have been on cloud for a while. So this is quite dramatic development. Uh, so, uh, you can see that the cloud adoption is different uh, in the different European countries. The Nordics and Netherlands uh, had already in 2018 about 40% cloud usage, uh, while Romania and Greece only had 13%. But today it has changed. Uh, so uh, what is the motivation for all these enterprises to move to the cloud? So um, for a couple of years ago, uh, uh, we had a, a maturity analysis of the market in Norway, just to see what was the motivation. And uh, before 2019, the cost reduction was a, the most uh, important factor, but now uh, it has changed. So the reduced time to market with new dig digital solution is, the most important motivational factor, which means that being able to answer to market quickly uh, is seen as the biggest achievement. And you have driving digital transformation and drive business innovation. You see that the reduced cost is still there, but it's, it's on the fifth place. And in, in between there, you have the business, improved business scalability. So there are quite much uh, good points uh, here to bring on. And uh, this is a representative selection of, uh, of uh, organizations from both public and the private sector. So, uh, but what are the challenges? They have motivation to move to the cloud, but which challenges do they meet when they try to move to the cloud? And the very number one challenge is actually lack of cloud expertise. They see that the, the cloud, uh, it develops quite fast. There's an uh, exponential technology innovation. Things are happening so fast that it's very difficult to actually keep track of everything. Uh, and uh, there's also uh, considerable complexity in migrating legacy applications. People are afraid of vendor lock-in and you have the concerns about security and compliance. Uh, and storing data abroad. Uh, today, actually, the security concerns, they are decreasing because uh, uh, organizations are getting more and more familiar with the cloud and they know which security mechanisms they can take advantage of. But the compliance part is still standing there as a barrier. So, um, when talking about uh, the barriers, what are the actually experienced benefits of going to the cloud? So we first told about the motivations and then the challenges. No, let's take a look at the experience benefits. What did they experience when they went to the cloud? And you can recognize the greater scalability, which was on number four of the motivation. So they actually made the scalability part and the shorter time to market. Yeah, they did it. That was uh, num number one, actually. And then 
there's quite IT techy and infrastructural related uh, aspects here, uh, higher availability, uh, shorter infrastructure deployment time, improved IT security, improved IT operational efficiency. And there's many, many more techy experiences and positive uh, effects of going to the cloud than expected from uh, the motivation part. And if you remember in the motivation part, we also mentioned uh, things about uh, digital transformation and innovation, and they are not here. So what happened with the innovation part? It seems that it requires something more to actually take the real benefits out of it on an organizational level. So, um, but how can we unleash the potential of the cloud? Our experience is that the advantages is, is far greater than the disadvantages, uh, but how can you actually avoid all the challenges. Gartner, have, they co came up with the solution path for implementing a public cloud strategy. And they told that uh, moving to cloud is not only about technology, it has very much to do with the organization. So good and clear cloud strategy uh, is very important in the very beginning and it needs organizational commitment in order to set the right direction for the cloud adventure. And then it's about establishing uh, yeah, the cloud strategy. Um, and uh, as you see about 2022, about 70% of the organizational or organizations will have one. You can advance to the next slide. After having established a good cloud strategy and uh, assessed uh, the infrastructure and applications and developing the use cases, then you start to build the cloud foundations. You get access to the technology, build competence, you integrate the core infrastructure and you uh, architect and mitigate risks, which means that you actually uh, established the foundation for migration to the cloud. And you start to migrate to the cloud. You have a migration strategy, uh, letting you select, uh, choose what to do with applications and workloads. You can migrate something, but something you have to start from scratch and build uh, build new applications instead. Um, but moving to the cloud, yeah, you also have to consider whether you have to prepare for uh, going multi-cloud at the later stage or hybrid cloud. Actually decide what, how, and when to migrate. And then uh, when you are in the cloud, uh, you kind of have to establish the good governance of the cloud uh, to develop, develop self-service strategies uh, and uh, to take cost control. And finally, when achieving operational excellence, you're optimizing monitoring and optimizing the consumption, automating and implementing management tools for multi-cloud and hybrid solutions. And as an overview, uh, they've been through uh, the solution path from Gartner very briefly, consisting of a cloud strategy, cloud migration part and the cloud brokerage part. As you can see, the cloud security part 
it will be a concern all the way through. I've talked a bit about motivation, challenges, and experienced benefits of moving to the cloud, and briefly presented the solution path for implementing a public cloud strategy. Um, and now we'll take a look at how Google Cloud Platform fits into this picture. And I let uh, my colleague Morten take over. You can start with presenting yourself. Yeah, I will. Hello, hello. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, if you can't, raise your hand or type in the chat or something like that. It's good to be here. Uh, I'm Morten Forfang. Uh, I'm a director at Competus, a colleague of Hans that was talking right now. And um, I work on pre-sales cloud uh, for a lot uh, of my time here at uh, this company. I am a former associate professor. I sit in statistical pattern recognition. I know academia and uh, have a um, long history of doing research and publishing papers and doing teaching and seeking funding and things like that. Um, so I, I, th I think I have sort of fair insight into uh, what academia in general would, uh, would like from the cloud and with new technology and things like that. Uh, my PhD is in artificial intelligence. I'll, I'll um, for another 15, 20 minutes or something like that, I'll, I'll talk to you about um, the platform, the Google Cloud platform uh, in, in, from a number of angles. Um, I'm from engineering, you know, I'm not sales, I'm not marketing. So, so I'm not gonna be technical. Um, and everything I'll talk about, I think will be perfectly plain and understandable, but um, maybe I'll provide a perspective coming from engineering and having this you know, authentic touch to it or something like that. So, so after sort of uh, presenting or talking very broadly about the Google platform, uh, Cloud Platform, I'll, I'll delve into maybe differentiators or give you some kind of feel for you know, why Google Cloud? Why, why not Azure? Why not AWS? Why not just stay in your data center? Things like that. And then I'll um, briefly, very briefly, touch upon some, some highlights from, from the product catalog, things that in our engineers like particularly well and particularly uh, sort of with a thought for research and development. And then I'll sort of um, be slightly into cost. I'll sort of just show you some examples of what, what do these things actually cost? You know, what, what, uh, how is it going hit, to hit your wallet when you start working with these things? Um, right. And then I'll try to give you some kind of practical feel for how it is to work on a cloud platform like this. And I'll end off with, with talking about, uh, you know, we're from Computus and uh, how Computus as a solution partner fits in with, with Google, why are we here kind of thing? Why, why don't we just sort of concentrate on the Google Cloud Platform and that's it. So that's, uh, that's um, my agenda, I guess. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's great with questions. I, I know you guys are sitting in a virtual um, and, and are being part of a virtual audience and it's hard to sort of get in touch and get a feel kind of thing. But, you know, we're normal guys on, on this side of the table. Um, and it, no question is too stupid, really. Um, I make absolutely no assumptions whatsoever with respect to where you come from or how your questions are phrased. We will, you know, having, if we manage to in some way establish some kind of dialogue such that uh, we get some kind of feel for, you know, what, what is interesting to you guys? What, what, uh, what are the things that you are wondering about that I think will enhance the experience um, for all of us? and sort of get it a bit more focused and you will sort of perhaps leave with a feeling that, um, oh, I learned something here or, hmm, okay, fine. I'm something more to think about that. So, so that would be great. Uh, type in the chat or Caroline, is it such that they can also speak or isn't it such like that? Yes, so it's a thumbs up from behind the consoles here. So, so yeah, um, you can also just, you know, speak, that's fine. Oh, well, um, having talked about all that, uh, maybe we could sort of have another slide, Caroline. Right, so sort of start off with talking in very broad terms about the Google Cloud. And as your disparate audience, I have no idea really on how many of you actually sort of used cloud services, um, as in from any sort of develop, software development side. I mean, you've used a lot of cloud services just being in the, in the digital sphere, but 
you know, with respect to doing development or building IT systems or things like that. So the, the, the Google Cloud is one of the three big on, on in the Western hemisphere on public clouds, if you want to. There are a number of other actors as well. And there are lots of specialized actors, but it's a, one of those really broad cloud platforms, which we as a professional solution provider uh, use for building software for, for, for all kinds of clients, basically. And similarly to then Azure and AWS being, being the bigger kids on the block, um, it's, it's, um, the catalog is wide, it's deep, it's mature. And one of the excellent sides of working with the, with the cloud is this thing that like, you know, they're subject to so much scrutiny. It's used across so many contexts that the stuff that they're putting out in general is stitched together in, in a way that is usually a notch above all the types of quality you would normally come across uh, from, from single vendors uh, on site things, because if it wasn't, it wouldn't deliver basically. And you've got, as you can see on the list there, all kinds of services, all kinds of applications. It covers infrastructure, it covers data, it covers applications, it covers analytics. And there is also tech, you know, on, on the side, there are also productivity tools like word processors and spreadsheets and things like that, that ties in very nicely. If you so wish to sort of provide data or be interactive in that way with the platform and things like that. If, if we were to ask, um, as I said, you know, I, I work as a director on technical pre-sale and I work across lots of teams with our engineers. And if we were to ask our engineers things that they like particularly well with the Google platform, there would be quite a number of things. Uh, each of these platforms have their specialties if you want to. And one of the things that I think they would point out is that one thing is to do something, put some data in, do some predictions, do some, uh, you know, make a report, something like that, and do it as a one-off. Then you point and click and you have a GUI and things like that. That's great. All the platforms have that, uh, Google Cloud in, um, included. But if you want to do it repeatedly, if you want to do it as, you know, a service that's there and which has quality and, you know, other people can consume, then you need to automate the things. You need to essentially use it in a programmatic way. And that's, that's a critical aspect of using uh, the cloud platform in a slightly more professional way, if you want to. And the, um, the, the cloud platform is particularly good with respect to using application programmers interfaces, using it programmatically, doing whatever you can do on the screen in a click and point and click thing. Uh, you could also do um, from a programming language, writing a script or a program, exercising exactly the same functions. Not all the big public cloud providers are equally good on this, this aspect. And then if we move from there to talking a little bit about what sort of are the differentiators, what are, what are, you know, what are highlights for research and development? One thing that characterizes the Google platform is that the many of the core products, the mature core products that we use all the time are in fact just wrappers on top of open source projects. And that has a number of advantages. One of them is that there is a, usually a large community. These are flagship open source projects. And there is a large community. You, you find tons of stuff on Stack Exchange and various places where you can just look for that really weird little detail you are working on. And it gives you obviously insight into the, the internal mechanics of the products. They are virtually bug-free. They have been through so much scrutiny that the quality is usually very high. And then Google sort of build, builds a wrapper on top of it, making it managed. So you don't have to install it. You don't have to deal with hardware where you don't have to sort of tune it, things like that. So that's kind of sort of the best of both worlds in that sense. And that brings us onto another thing that is also a very strong suit from Google, the Google Cloud. And that is that it has a very strong focus on, on multi-cloud being sort of, you know, I have this workload, you know, a job, a program, something that runs. Can I move it into the cloud? But if I didn't like the Google Cloud, can I move it out again? And that lack of vendor, lock in is, is a strong trait of Google Cloud, which is present in the other clouds as well, but maybe particularly strong with the Google Cloud. So should, you know, that, that lack of being locked in, you still have a selection 
that can make you locked in to a certain degree. You have, you have some choices there, but still broadly speaking, you have slightly easier paths out if you want that or moving your workloads to Azure or on site or something like that. Next slide, please. If we are to sort of look a little bit on, on some, what shall we say, product highlights, things that fit with research and development, and at the same time are things that are loved by our engineers with the Google Cloud Platform. It's, it's hard to get around the data warehouse product that Google has in, in one of its sort of core offerings, the big query. All the big public cloud providers provide managed data warehousing. That being, you know, the data warehouse is, is there. You don't have to sort of deal with underlying hardware issues. You don't have to upgrade it. You don't have to install it, things like that. That's the managed part if you want to. But managed still comes in different flavors in the sense that with some of the platform competitors, you would normally still have to think ever so slightly about underlying infrastructural things like how many compute nodes, how much memory are you going to use? You have to say something about storage. You essentially have to sort of commit yourself somewhat to something that is over time committing resources. That's, that's how they make money. BigQuery has this weird particular quality that no, you don't have to think about that at all. You can put in five bytes, you can put in two petabytes. Uh, it will run, it scales. You don't have to think about anything underlying with respect to hardware or scalability or anything. It just works, it responds. Uh, and you can focus on that solely. That is a unusual thing that makes it much like. Another thing that uh, many of our engineers like well is in, in high performance computing and high throughput computing, HTC, then uh, this ability to scale with respect to linear algebra, to doing sort of lots of vector operations and things like that is key. And we use, generally speaking, in computing, GPUs, graphical processing units, um, to, to do that job. Google has its own proprietary TPU, which is just basically a GPU on steroids. And when our engineers have ability to employ that, they are much like, because they're just basically faster, more bang for the buck in many cases than a normal GPU. Which also sort of brings me into sort of HPC and HTC as a general thing that is much loved. If you have previously been in a landscape where you solicit somewhere, fill in forms, you know, order some computing power because you have this job that is going to be run and you need to sort of acquire computing resources. And then afterwards, maybe you sort of have overcommitted over time because that job has then finished or there's less activity this month or whatever. The ability to just basically magically conjure up really powerful hardware, network, storage, whatever, use it when you need it, and then just tear it down. It takes minutes, basically, and it's all gone. Um, is, is a really amazing productivity thing. If you haven't tried that, then give it a shot, and you will very fast realize the enormous pull of cloud with respect to productivity and efficiency. There is no going back, essentially, when you've sort of tried that a couple of times. Next slide, please. Right. So then I've sort of given you <laughs> an, a really brief um, sort of um, overview and highlights of, of you know, what, what, it, what, what is the platform. Let's talk ever so slightly about money. If you were to use 60,000 euros in an IT budget and, and you were to use it on a on, on the Google Cloud Platform or public cloud platforms in general, but Google Platform here, how does that look? What does it buy you basically? Well, it, as you can see from the catalog, the catalog is wide and has lots of items there. So, you know, you, you can buy all kinds of things. But if, we, you know, if I think to, back to, to my history as an, an academic, what were, you know, essential core things that you needed? Well, computing power is certainly one. And they come in different flavors. And that sort of gives us a little bit of sort of the, the considerations you need to think about when you sort of use the cloud and which is different from having it on site or just acquired hardware if you want to. 
For example, you might want for a lab or for your research group or something, you want computing power that is there for the workdays. You want it when it's when people are all at work, but you don't want to pay for it during the night or on Saturday or something like that. And, and it's entirely ad hoc. You just, you know, you spin it up when you need it and you kill it when you don't. And you can also freeze it and let it be and it doesn't consume anything. And then it should just be sort of, you know, taken out of the freeze draft course if you want to. So you can have sort of 50 normal computers like that. That will set you back some 500 euros a month. Or you could, for HPC purposes, having that, you know, those fables TPUs for some, some heavy duty work with, you know, tons of RAM and things like that. Fine. I could set you back a little bit more. Or you might be, be doing containers, which is really hot these days. You know, you, you have standardized workloads, you know, that application, that job or whatever you want to run. And you want to run it on a cluster. And you want to serve some data. Sometimes you want to do it on site. Sometimes you, perhaps the data is in Azure. Sometimes you want it on Google Cloud. You want to run that Kubernetes cluster and you want to generally be there 24 by seven. So this is not like just working hours. Okay, so that's going to set you back 200 euros a month. Likewise with storage, you know, give me 200 terabytes uh, of storage and you can see that there's some cold line and some standard things and things like that. So these are, those are things you specify, which has to do with how for how long time do you commit yourself? And that has consequences for the prices. So 100 terabytes for just a normal hard disk if you want to, um, uh, but which comes with availability. It's always there. You don't have to think about like, you know, ooh, my hardware broke down. It's not there anymore. Oh my God, I need to buy a new hard disk or something like that. It's always there. It always works. So with that, um, maybe that will set you back some 1,700 euros. But if you prefer to have a cold line such that you committed yourself for over a longer time, then it's much cheaper. And for that data warehouse I was talking about, 50 terabytes of that data, um, um, uh, data warehouse will perhaps set you back some a little bit more than 1,000 euros per month. On network, it's such that um, Ingress, as we say, as in data coming into the cloud is usually free for all the big cloud, cloud providers. And with the Ochre framework, you have, to you have to send quite a lot of data out of the network before you have to start paying for that at all. So, so getting data in and getting data out for many practical purposes is just free, basically. And then I was thinking, okay, so what else would one use as a, as a researcher or you know, in an academic setting? And just to, just to give some examples, there are tons of really nifty software as a service things. That's in services that you just call, and it's just a thing that works out in the cloud, and you get some results back, basically. So, you know, I have a hundred thousand documents that I would like to do OCR on. I want to, you know, recognize characters and language and figures and whatever. Um, okay, that's going to set you back eighty euros a month to do that every month. Um, compare that to you know, buying a license for software, doing the same kind of thing and running it in your, you know, on storage, it doesn't really compare. And, and rounding off this part, you know, is this cheap? Well, it all depends, doesn't it? I mean, what are you comparing with? If you have something already and you'd written, written it off, then it's obviously expensive because you've already written off the costs. But if you're going to sort of take into account things like, you know, acquiring this, the, the hardware, paying for electricity, doing all the procedural stuff for actually acquisition and buying stuff, um, you know, um, the, 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 the physical areas where you have it in your data center, maybe even wages for the people who sort of work with these things on an operational basis, things like that, well, then it might look different, right? So those are the things that you need to think about in such case. Another slide, please. Uh, Hans, I'm, I'm sort of until 10.45 roughly, am I? Yes. That's fine. Okay. That's right. We'll see how that goes. On. Right. I mean, talked about cost for such a short time, I guess. Hope that sort of gave you some kind of feeling for roughly what it would set, uh, set you back. I didn't mention that, that also there is for all those services I was talking about now, free tiers, as in, you know, there, you have to be above a certain threshold before the, 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 the meter starts counting at all. So she said for lots of sort of, you know, when you set up and for lots of normal day-to-day -day stuff that you just want to try out and play around with and things like that, uh, the, the bill will either be zero or negligible. I mean, we have 
in our company, uh, with our engineers, when we train them, when they play around with things and things like that, and we build small proofs of concepts and sh showcase things for customers, things like that, you know, the bill is frequently in, in tens of euros, hundreds of euros. I mean, it's absolutely nothing, basically. So that's also something to consider. Well, anyway, uh, I was thinking of then sort of delving slightly into how does it practically feel? What, what, what you know, how, how do you use these things? And I got way too short time to actually, you know, go through a demo or something like that. But I'll give you at least some kind of flavor. If you have some data, you've been out measuring some data in a field and you're a biologist and you sort of measured something about animals and, and you are wondering, you have this hypothesis, could it be that like in their mass, their weight basically, is dependent on a number of factors that is part of your measurement in your experiment. How do you go about that? One way of going about that uh, would be to put it, you know, you have a CSV file, you have a sort of a tabular tree file, an Excel spreadsheet, you know, something like that. And you go into BigQuery, that data warehouse thing and you press import on your you know, uh, GUI or graphical user interface and you import your data and it appears as columns as you would see on the spreadsheet. And then you can write SQL statements. You can write queries if you want to. That's normally what you do with a data warehouse. Um, and then the data warehouse as it is with the other vendors as well, Machine learning comes out of the box, you know. Oh, you wanna do regression as they call it, you know, guessing values given something else. Uh, that's fine. Um, that we, we can just do out of the box. You can build models. You can uh, get predictions out of the box uh, with just writing uh, SQL statements as I'm having here on the left side. And it comes out as, as a predicted column, the column number two there, where it sort of guesses on all the weights of the different kind of um, penguins that have been measured with all kinds of measurements. But maybe you're not too comfortable with writing SQL or maybe you don't want it in a, in a data warehouse. Next slide, please. So then um, you could go to Google's managed AI services. And there is a wide selection there, everything from sort of really easy, just point and click. I got my data, I wanna train them. I want to sort of predict uh, my weight on, on my penguins afterwards. I wanna see what kind of, uh, uh, you know, running an experiment basically. So you can do that. That's, you know, the screenshot on the upper left side there, or, you could be a researcher. Oh, you know, I write my stuff in R. I write my stuff in Python. I want to sort of, you know, import my stuff there and do that. And that, now we're back to that API thing I was mentioning in the first or second slide. Everything you can do on your GUI, you could also do programmatically. So you could tie it very easily into code, MATLAB, whatever you got already uh, running. Next slide, please. And it might be that after a while, you know, some of your co-researchers are saying, hey, blast, you know, all those uh, predictions you have on, on weight of penguins, can I use that as well, please? Of course you can. And, you know, you can, uh, Google comes in that AI menu of managed services. You could also then say, yeah, that model, I want to serve that model and I want it to deal it out only to our researchers because, you know, this is really critical research material and it's going to be the basis of our papers. So then you can do this is version one of my model and you click a button and it says it's served to these users and that's it. And then sort of, you know, you're moving ever so slightly then from being that experimental one-off, just trying things out and starting to build infrastructure that kind of sort of ticks and runs and which is available to other and which is about sharing and then sort of collaborative work and things like that, right? It's really easy. You don't have to have much technical knowledge to do these things if you're from some kind of scientific field. And if you wonder, okay, so, so how much money have I spent on this? Then generally the Google Cloud, as the other cloud providers, come with dashboards that are just basically ready-made for you where you could look at how much you've spent over the last period, you know, broken down on different products. And you can also have forecasts on how much money will I be spending if I continue like this, things like that. And you can obviously make your own custom dashboards and sort of, you know, measure lots of other stuff that either has to do with subject matter things or financial things, if you want to really easily and with not much technical expertise there either, uh, if you so wish. Yeah, I'm sort of, sort of running a bit at the time, I guess. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Right, so let me round off by talking a little bit about like in, so why is computers here? 
why why aren't we just talking about Google Cloud and and why aren't we talking to Google? Why 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 do we have to go all these roundabout with with computers? Well, that's really easy. Um, Google builds products; they build a platform. You know, you got this huge shelf, as I showed you in slide three or something, where you can pick whatever, and it's really easy to put them together, right? It is also really easy to do stupid things. It's really easy to spend a lot of money if you just, you know, oh, I want this huge CPU with tons of memory and just get going and go away on a vacation for a few weeks. Spend a ton of money. You can set up alerts. You can be warned that you are now about to spend money and things like that. But I'm trying to get to that. Having all these Lego pieces, if you want to, is one thing. And that's great. Lots of shapes, lots of colors. But building a house that fits some kind of purpose, putting all these pieces together, well, that's an entirely different ballgame. And that's where a solution house, a solution provider like us comes into it. We have done this a ton of times before. We are able to guide you, teach you, work with you, give you workshops, uh, give you some kind of nudge. Yeah, great, you've done the, these tutorials. I understand that you're stuck on this particular point. You know, why don't you look at this? Have an example here, things like that. So tailoring and making you capable to do this yourself, but nudging you along the way, giving you competence, giving you blueprints, making you able to set it up in a secure way, in a cost-effective way, making you able to keep overview and governance as lots of research groups are starting to use this. So you've got control and freedom at the same time. Those are the things that we bring to the table. Oh, well, um, yeah, roughly there. Uh, Hans, are you gonna take it from here? Yes, thank you, Morten. Um, then I'll take you a little bit out of Google Cloud uh, and uh, more into the Okra, how to start uh, with getting into the Okra uh, agreement. Um, here's a simple uh, few steps uh, to get into Okra. Uh, first of all, um, uh, you have to register in the Computas Okra GCP client portal. Uh, concerning uh, Finnish uh, institutions, they have actually have to get in touch with CSC, the Finnish NRAN, in order to initiate the process. But then you will register in the Computas Okra portal. During uh, the process in the portal, you will enter the call of agreement, which actually uh, is making uh, the services uh, available for you. Uh, you are now eligible to order Okra services with Okra terms and conditions. Um, but you can take advantage of this after step three, the, the onboarding. That's actually uh, providing access to the Google Cloud Platform and the Google Cloud Platform services. The first three steps, uh, they are quite easy, not very time consuming. It can easily be done within one week. Um, and that's the whole idea with uh, the Okra framework. It's to bring uh, the cloud suppliers closer to the research and educa higher education institutions to remove administrative burden. Um, so if you know that you want the GCP, the Google Cloud Platform, then you can actually enter the agreement directly. You can order services directly without carrying out the procurement process because the procurement process has already been carried out by Giant. So it's, it's totally fine to just enter, uh, register, enter the agreement and uh, to onboard and then start to take uh, to use the uh, services on the public cloud. 
So of course, uh, when starting to use the services uh, for different purposes, uh, you may meet, uh, as Morten mentioned, the uh, needs of uh, value-added services, uh, advisory services or workshops, and that's a part of our uh, service catalog. And then uh, it's more about to become more self-service so that your organization can take advantage of uh, the access to the uh, platform within a certain, uh, within uh, in a controlled environment, so to say. So uh, for instance, this is a very nice uh, way to kind of get an overview of uh, 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 shadow IT, to remove shadow IT, to establish uh, more central control of uh, uh, the cloud usage in your organization. So uh, this is easy five steps. Uh, and um, uh, this is actually the end of uh, the presentation and we're over to the Q&A part. And uh, please feel free to ask questions. Are there any questions? Do we have any questions from the audience? No, not yet. Okay, uh, I can post a question. Um, Morten, I ask you, uh, how would you establish a solution for gathering and analyzing field data on the GCP? Yeah, that's, um, that's a recurring question that you, um, at least before there were virtual audiences and we had a bit more touch. Was, uh, those were one of the questions that came up a couple of times, yeah, that's true. Um, it, it depends. I mean. It's, if you're a single researcher and you just, you know, you, I got my field measurements here, how do I proceed from there? Then as I was talking about, like in, you, you go to your console GUI basically and you click import data on your data warehouse or on your bucket or something like that and you upload it. And then you can from there start like in profiling your data with products that are visual and very nice like that. If you want to sort of, if you have a setup where like in, you know, you have uh, lab equipment or where you have um, IoT devices, uh, you know, things that are out there, lots of small things, uh, measuring things. Then the Google platform comes with uh, specialized products that, that sort of serve IoT, for example, or serve connectors um, that, that deal with integration issues such that you, you can sort of more automatically over time get the data in and build a pipeline, things like that. Um, was that an answer, Hans? Yes, I suppose so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, let me ask a question to Michael. Um, how do you ensure proper security setup of the GCP, Michael? Yeah, uh, it's uh, quite easy. I have a slide if uh, and a couple of uh, few. Uh, there you have it. Uh, we are uh, creating a landing page on GCP, actually creating a GCP organization where you are actually be able to centralize, manage all your identities and all the projects and everything. And the onboarding is uh, quite easy. And uh, well, uh, for creating this GCP organization, it's just a matter of having a DNS update uh, or a file. Uh, then it's uh, because you need to authorize that you actually own the domain. And uh, we highly recommend to connect uh, uh, the uh, identities that are going to use the console to an existing identity provider. And you can also use SSO. It's quite easy if you have Azure ID. Uh, it's uh, also possible to use other, other things uh, like on-premise Active Directory, or if you really want to, you can use cloud identity as a standalone. We really don't recommend that if you have an already an existing airline provider that we can use. And if it's a large setup, then you will be maintaining two identity catalogs and that is never a good idea. In this same meeting, we also do a quick introduction to, to the IAM structure and the billing structure. 
And after that, it's quite easy to delegate projects uh, or sandbox areas uh, if you have different departments. And one thing that is uh, important in uh, in GCP is that all projects are completely separated uh, unless you really want them to not uh, or you can connect the networks, but uh, in in the starting point, there is a completely separated. So every project is uh, quite easy to just delegate to, to different departments. And very practically speaking, also if you're sort of a single researcher and you got these, you know, my penguin data, as was the example, and we share that with Michael, then you know, as long as we both got access to the same project where I got stored my data. I sort of go up on the, in the GUI again and I, you know, click on Michael and I say that Michael can read all those data or he can be the owner or he can sort of write data and new data or something like that. And that's how you sort of deal out um, um, access rights and, and sort of control it on a very sort of local, very sort of, you know, practical aspect of it. Um, well, thank you. Um, uh... Okay, I'm an expert on machine learning, but not in the cloud, not on GCP. What can I do? Um, Am I the subject of that question as well, or do you have other experts in your no, hands? Yeah, if you feel to answer it. <laughs> <you're welcome. laughs> That's fine. Um, you know, if you're an expert in AI and you haven't um, used AI in the cloud first, you have missed out. But having said that, um, it's, it's, you know, as I said, it's a huge catalog of things. You can do point and click and I don't have to really concern myself with lots of the details at all. I'm only concerned with having some kind of logistic regression or whatever, and I want to predict my category, so I, you know, something like that. But Google is kind of sort of, you know, the home of TensorFlow. It's kind of sort of home of Keras. It's um, the home of TPUs, as we were talking about. So there is this enormous catalog of things where you can sort of go down the, the floors and, you know, I want it managed still, but I want control over my models. No, I want to really, you know, I want to hold my model here. I want to have it locally on my cold. I want to deal with it there. And I might want to uh, import it afterwards. Um, you, you got that full range from you know world class deep networks extreme control running on, on my own infrastructure connecting my gpus into it and having control of the entire stack or just doing it really easy managed on top it's all there and it's really easy to get into thank you and uh, by the way we have also uh uh, uh, produced a half-day workshop for uh, machine learning experts uh, in order to teach them how to take advantage of your machine learning expertise uh, in the cloud. So we'll probably come up with a podcast uh, a little bit later. Okay. Uh, I think we should take a final uh, questionnaire. Um, uh, how can I find data that other researchers have? How can we have a common data repository to share data and use for publications and reproducible labs? Uh, Martin, a couple of comments. This is at least for organizations, academic and otherwise, a requirement that frequently comes up and, and many are interested in. And I said, you know, in my practical illustrations of those three slides or whatever, I, I did give you some, a, a slight teaser where I said, you know, you can push an import button, put your data set in BigQuery, for example, or in a bucket of Blob store. And as Michael was into with a proper setup of, of how access rights are done, then that's essentially it on that level. But also, if you want more systemic approach to it, you know, you, you want something that is shared and easy to find across an organization or part of an organization, you know, you got search products where you sort of, you know, input either just metadata or also instance data, as in the, the data itself. 
and make them searchable and make them searchable for only certain groups or under certain circumstances, things like that. And there are data catalog products which deal with metadata such that like in, you would be able to sort of align how data looks here, how they're named here, taxonomies, ontologies, things like that. So that, you know, I call this type of data this and you call it that and that, you know, we get sort of some, some kind of common language and some common way of referring to these things, such as it's easier to find. All those things also come as part of the product portfolio of the Google Cloud. Um, fancy stuff, really easy to get into. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, we have, of course, have, uh, more questions, but I think um, uh, we can rather send the uh, questions to uh, the audience. Um, do you have the final slide, uh, Carly? Yes, thank you. So if you want to know more, feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, uh, use this email address, jian.oker at computas.com or call me directly, please. And I've also added a link to the Ochre service catalog and discount information. And there you will also find a link to uh, reg registration um, in the client portal. Um, are there any questions? Final questions from the audience? Okay, I hope that everybody are happy and uh, I wish you all a nice day. And thank you very much for joining this webinar from uh, Computas. Bye-bye.